Hi, I'm David Abrams, and I want to welcome you to this edition of the Tenant Experience Network podcast. I want to welcome today's guest, Jeff Dennis, entrepreneur in residence at Faskin, trusted advisor to the CEOs of fast growth companies and author of Lessons from the Edge, a book which is a collection of stories by 50 entrepreneurs sharing their biggest mistakes in business and the lessons they have learned. In this episode, we will learn about Jeff's journey to his current position at Faskin, where he combines his learning from being an entrepreneur with his expertise as a business advisor and lawyer. We will tap into his thinking around curiosity, his desire for lifetime learning, and the ability to reinvent himself as his keys to success, and get a glimpse into what is top of mind for Jeff as he continues to navigate through new challenges and emerging opportunities. We're excited to be sharing this podcast with you, so make sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode of the Tenant Experience Network. And now I'd like to welcome Jeff to the show. Hey, Jeff, I'm really glad you could be with us today. How are you? I'm great. Thanks. Thanks for having me on. I'm really looking forward to this. All right. Uh, So let's start with your journey to your current position Uh, as entrepreneur in residence at Faskin, certainly an interesting description right out out of the gate. I would love to hear how you got started and what led you to this particular role. Yeah, I'm definitely the oddball at a place like Faskin. Um, When I started there eight years ago, I I think I was the only entrepreneur in residence in a law firm anywhere. Uh, It's now become a bit of a thing. Uh, But my background, I'm, uh, I'm a lawyer by education practiced briefly a long time ago, uh, started a business in the late 80s. Uh, I was in finance. We raised money from uh, essentially high net worth people for various types of projects and and investment opportunities. And uh, after exiting that business after many years, like 25 years, um, I started working with early stage entrepreneurs, helping them share the things that I had learned um, and helping them, you know, launch businesses, uh, scale businesses, finance businesses, and ultimately, I joined Faskin as their entrepreneur in residence. Um, I wasn't really looking for a job. I hadn't had a job since 1989, uh, and this was 2012. Um, but I was looking for a place to hang out, and I'd been networking and talking to people about, you know, give me an office, we'll do this, I'll you'll do that, because I've always been very self sufficient. Um, anyhow, I bumped into a buddy of mine at Faskin, and they were struggling with how does big law do business with emerging tech companies and, you know, very expensive offices and fancy lawyers. And, you know, it was intimidating. And so I joined them as the entrepreneur in residence <clears throat> to help them figure that out. Um, so my role is kind of twofold. I'm part uh, intrapreneur, building a small business there, offering legal services to early stage companies on a completely different business model. And I'm part business advisor, sharing my network, sharing my experience, sharing, um, uh, you know, my expertise, I guess. And then I guess to a small extent, I'm part lawyer, although I'm surrounded by lots of really smart lawyers who do a lot of the heavy lifting. Um, so for me, it's just really been the perfect role. Uh, eight years later, we now have over 40 lawyers across Canada full-time dedicated to this space. I, would, I think we're the leading firm in it. So um, it's been a pretty good run, and, and I've really enjoyed my time there. Amazing. Well, as you know, uh, you and I first connected. I heard you speak at the DMZ uh, through their Sandbox program. Uh, and for, you know, I was suitably impressed at the time. You and I connected immediately. Uh, as you said, you're always willing to meet with founders. You met with me, I think, the next day. And, you know, within a couple of days, uh, I, I was welcomed into the Faskin startup program. And it's been a great ride. So um, really excited to have the opportunity today to, to delve deeper um, and get thank to know you even better. Thank you. Yeah, uh, it's uh, thank you. So why do you think you were uniquely suited uh, to this opportunity? Are there any unique skills that have helped you to be successful? Well, you know, it's, um, I've had a lot of experience, uh, you know, I, I guess my strengths, I would say are being very curious, 
<clears throat> always <clears throat> interested in every business, interested in trying to learn new things, you know, lifetime learning. So I'm, I'm just very curious and, and it's something that drives me. You know, almost every day a new company comes through the door. It's all new technology solving problems with new solutions. And I'm just like a kid in a candy store. You know, I, you know maybe I have ADD. I don't know. But uh, I really, that's really something that drives me is the curiosity and, and the desire to understand. And the other thing that seems to motivate me is a, is a desire to help people, um, you know, to try and solve problems. And to try and you know figure out the solution as people present them, um, you know I've thought a lot about you know what it takes to you know succeed in business and life, and you know that's a big question. But um, I, I think that there are some life skills that people can develop that help you, I guess, reinvent oneself over and over again during one's career, and that's really what I've done. Um, so it's a big conversation because I've, I've actually been thinking about a book or an online course or something along that topic as a, as a sequel to my earlier book, Lessons from the Edge. Mm -hmm. um, so you talked about, you know, really wanting to be helpful to others. Um, and I, I was probably going to talk about this a little bit later on, but I know that you, during this difficult time for so many people, you, you extended an offer out to other founders uh, to encourage them to connect with you. And I wonder if you could just share uh, a little bit of what that process was like and, and anything you may have learned from that. Sure. You know, when the COVID situation arose back in March, like everyone else, I was kind of dazed and confused and was, you know, sitting at home trying to figure out, you know, now what do I do? I'm the outside guy. I'm out speaking, writing, doing, and, you know, trying to figure out how does one be relevant in that environment? And then it occurred to me, well, everyone else was dazed and confused. And, you know, I know from my own experience as an entrepreneur and working with so many that it can be lonely at the top that, you know, at times of crisis, um, entrepreneurs don't have a lot of people sometimes to talk to and go to, you know, there's well-meaning people surrounding them, but if they haven't walked a mile in their shoes, they don't really understand. And, you know, you can go talk to your lawyer who can give you great advice, but they've never had to make payroll like this. You know, you can talk to your accountant, same thing, your spouse, uh, your employees, like some stuff you just can't discuss with them. So who do you go to? So, you know, a lot of people have their, you know, EO or YPO form groups and tech and all these other things. But I knew that there was a lot of people sort of out there twisting in the wind who would just like someone to talk to. And not that I had any answers or thought that I would have any answers, but it was almost like business therapy you know, tell me your story, how can I help? And if it's just listening, that's help enough. But if I can share my network or my experience or whatever, um, then so be it. And I think I helped a few people, uh, certainly just by giving them someone to talk to. Um, but I learned a lot. Like for me, it was just an incredible learning experience because you know, in the midst of this terrible situation, I really had my finger on the pulse uh, of, of, of the startup community. I spoke to over 60 founders in about three weeks and, uh, you know, half hour session, Zoom like this, and just trying to figure out if there was something I could do to help them or just talk it through or whatever. And what I realized that there was kind of a spectrum you know, there were the casualties and you know who they are, retail, restaurants, hotels, I mean, just obvious stuff. And then there were a bunch of lottery winners, people who, you know, vaccines, PPE, ventilators, you know, e-learning, e-commerce, anything with an E in it, you know, was, was a winner. And then everybody else was kind of in the middle. And, you know, my feeling about it at the time, and I think, I, I think I've think i been borne out, is that people had to pivot. You know, if you, if you stayed st standing still, you could end up being a casualty. But if you found a way to become relevant and pivot in this environment and understand that this trend and this, you know, the effects of the COVID will be certainly longer lasting than 60, 90, 120 days, then you had to make changes and that those people who kind of came to the problem that way were going to be 
winners and lottery winners too, hopefully. Right. So that was really what I learned and uh, I was grateful for it. So, you know, like anything else, when you give and you help, there's always a benefit coming back the other way. Um, it's not necessarily linear, you know, one to one. It's There's a bit of a karmic element of it where, you know, just things come back eventually. And, yeah. and I kind of live by that. Right. Well, a big shout out to you for, for making that overture and, and taking that time and, and, and helping to invest in, in our community. Um, and I know for, for me and, and for my team at Hilo, certainly you can't, you can't invent opportunity coming out of COVID. It's either there or it isn't, but you have to at least be aware enough to see it. And, and as we've looked at our platform and how it can be more effective in helping our clients, um, you know, repopulate workplaces and invite people back to, um, you know, the workplace community and feel safe and secure, we know that, you know, for example, our platform has a role to play in that. So I think it's where companies can find that unique opportunity. Um, not that any of us would have, you know, wanted COVID just for the sake of finding that opportunity, but I think when it's there, um, it certainly will, will help us move forward. Uh, when I think about your path, uh, you know, lawyer, um, entrepreneur, and now, you know, um, founder and then entrepreneur in residence within the within that legal environment again, it's certainly a, a unique path. If, if there were people that wanted to follow that path, any, any suggestions, any advice for them um, as they sort of explore how those avenues can all intersect? You know, when I finished school, we were taught and socialized to think that, you know, you get this great job with some kind of corporation or government or institution. And, you know, 30 years later, you're going to get a gold watch and retire. And that was success. Mm -hmm. um, and it didn't turn out that way for my peers. Um, some, but not as many as thought it. And it's not turning out that way for millennials. I mean, nobody graduates school these days with that expectation. Um, so it seems to me that the most important thing people can be is self-sufficient. And that's the life skill. Like, you know, if you can figure out how you can always eat, <laughs> then the rest is easy. Um, so that's really been my approach is really trying to figure out how to be self-sufficient, um, not rely on other people. Um, you know, if things end at a play, you know, Faskin after eight years because of a COVID or retirement or whatever, it's, you know, it doesn't come as a surprise to me. That's just part of kind of life's journey. So I, I come to it with that outlook, I guess, number one. Um, you know, for me, I, about 15 years ago, as I was going through all these various reinventions and career shifts or whatever you want to call it, pivots, um, I, th I thought it was time to be intentional about it. So I, somebody had introduced me to a great book called Unique Ability by a woman by the name of Catherine Nomura. And that book had a big impact. I actually bought two copies, gave one to a coach. And he and I, over the period of about 120 days, we worked on me in the context of this book. And the idea is that we all have this unique ability. You know, it's your superpower, it's your passion, whatever you call it. But the problem is that you become competent in various things that aren't necessarily your unique ability. You know, you go to law school and you learn how to be a lawyer and you can draft leases and contracts and negotiate and go to court even. But maybe that's not your unique ability. Or you can go to business school and you can learn how to do accounting and marketing and strategy. But, you know, and so the more educated you are, the more intelligent you are, the more experienced you get it becomes harder to figure it out, I think, at least was for me. And what this book allowed me to do was figure out what my unique ability is. And I've, it's kind of driven me ever since. Like every action and every career choice or decision has really been guided by that, that principle. And um, so that was helpful for me. Um, and like I said earlier, I think lifetime learning and this curiosity, because I, I may be overconfident or delusional or something, but I really think that, you know, if you give me a set of problems, I can find a solution. Um, and if not me, I can bring in a team that can find a solution. Right. So I, I have a level of confidence, I guess. Maybe it's from age and experience. Maybe it's just delusion, as some people think. But I don't know. I don't know if that answers the question. It's a, it's a difficult question to answer. 
No, really, really interesting. And we'll talk more about influences in your life, but clearly this book was one of them. Um, you spoke about problems and, and how you address those. So what's the biggest challenge you're currently experiencing and how do you think you'll overcome it? Well, I think this whole COVID <clears throat> business has really um, accelerated a lot of change that was in the, in the pipeline. I mean, we live in this age of digital transformation and it's, it's, I mean, you know, it's a revolution. It's whatever, the fourth, the fifth, the sixth industrial revolution. Um, and I don't think most people have kind of figured that out completely. Um, I mean, if you look at politics in the United States, for example, you know, there's 30 or 40 percent of the population are trying to turn the clock back to make America great again, as opposed to try and figure out what a great America looks like in the 21st century. And I think there's that's like there's a lot of people who haven't sort of come to grips with it. And I think the biggest challenge of of our generation is understanding how to deal with this, you know, exponential change that, that and humans adapt over millennia and we're now adapting, you know, exponentially quicker and quicker and required to do so. And that's the challenge, I think. Very interesting. Um, so if I gave you an extra hundred thousand dollars for you, your team, your business, Right now, what would you do with it? How would you spend it and why? You know, I don't, I don't, I've always been a small budget guy. Um, well, I, I didn't, I didn't say, I didn't say a hundred million. I did, I kept it. No, no, good. no, I know. But, you know, even at Faskin, you know, I was a bootstrap operation in terms of building this program. It was a bit of an experiment at the beginning. And so, you know, hiring me in the first place and my salary was like budget enough. And so I had a small marketing budget, but really it was grassroots and it was, you know, hand to hand combat that, you know, speaking and getting out and volunteering. And, you know, you saw me at the DMZ. That's because that's that was my budget was my time. And so, you know, I'm used to getting by on little budget. So. I'll, I'll start with that. But having said that, if I were to throw money at something today, I think it's education. I think it's training. I think it's upskilling. Like if I was a, a leader in a business, that's where I focus, um, you know, to create a culture where people are adaptable and agile and can help and grow with your business, I think is, is key these days. And a lot of people are afraid to spend money on education in, in business because you know, they think that that goes out, up and down the elevator or out the door or could go out the door if you lose them. But I think that education creates stickiness because people really appreciate it and it creates a culture. So I think that's what I would do. Right. Well, I love the notion of skill building. Um, we've done that in with our own team members and, and over the many years uh, of being an entrepreneur myself. I've always tried to invest uh, in those around me. Um, there's always that short term payback. Um, and, you know, depending upon their, their length of tenure, there's, there's the potential for long-term payback. But when you also hear that the experience that you've helped them acquire and or the knowledge you've helped them acquire, you know, maybe two, three years later has also helped them to leverage that and, um, and evolve their career, not always with you, but, but other opportunities. I think there's still some gratification in knowing that you, you've helped them along their, their journey as well. So um, I think there's, there, there's payback all along the way. I agree. Um, you talked about, uh, you know, my, my, my next question was all around resources, mentors, colleagues, or books that have helped you on your journey. You've talked about a book that was hugely influential. Um, just wondering uh, any other sources of, of influence in, in your world that, that have helped you uh, to be successful. Yeah, I was lucky. Um, I was a, a YPO brat. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the Young Presidents Organization, but my dad was a member of YPO when I was a kid. So I was exposed to the, that organization and culture as a, at a young age. And when I got involved in business, I became a founding member of the EO, the Entrepreneurs Organization chapter here in Toronto, and became very, like I drank the Kool-Aid and got very involved. Uh, I was a leader here and, and globally, and my book, Lessons from the Edge, came from that. And um, I was a sponge for all their content over many years. I must have attended 10 or 11 
you know, conferences, they call them universities, and rightfully so. So that was really my business school. Um, and the speakers and my forum group uh, of, you know, founders and the network that I built uh, globally, um, you know, it was huge just because of that organization. So I would say that was a big, big part of it. A um, lot of opportunities came to me from it, a lot of learning. Um, you know, I've read a ton about business, you know, good to great, you know, the Rockefeller habits. Uh, I mean, the list, you know, e-myth, you know, I'm forever re recommending books to clients just, you know, so for me, it's been lifetime learning um, and trying to understand and be curious. Um, and there's been a lot of mentors along the way who uh, have helped me. Um, so, you know, people that I admire, people who you know, gave me some advice along the way. Um, so, yeah, I've been lucky that way, I think. Well, I think building uh, that that network of whether it be content or colleagues or mentors uh, is, is so hugely important. Um, and I know for me, particularly in the last few years, as I've gone down this new path as a founder, um, you know, I, I would not have been uh, nearly uh, achieved what I have to date without, without the creating that network. And for me, that's come much later in life. Um, you know, running a, a traditional uh, business for, for the first part of my career, that 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 mentality was not always as, as present. And I think we live today, particularly in this startup tech ecosystem, uh, with just so much support and resource um, and, and a community that's very willing to share and, and, and counsel. So um, I agree. Really, I, I, I agree. And, and you got to take advantage. And like I said earlier, things are changing so fast. So if you don't, if you're, if you don't lift your head out of your bunker periodically to figure out what's going on in the world, you're going to, it's going to pass you by. So yeah. it, you know, doing those kinds of things, being in the community, um, being part of a, you know, a, a peer network, uh, all that stuff is just critical. Yeah. I, I think it's amazing to see all the different organizations that, you know, given the, the, the outcome of COVID have, have, you know, created these kinds of virtual learning opportunities. Um, and now I have found, because I've been a sponge for all of that, I have found myself having to just really evaluate um, and pick and choose more discerningly because there are just so many options. You could literally spend your, your whole day um, consuming um, content and, and information and, and learning opportunities. So um, really have to sort of pick and choose as, as we go forward. Um, so just curious, uh, you know, in your role, particularly an entrepreneurial role in a traditional law firm, can you share any details about anything new that you're working on uh, that you think our listeners might find interesting? Yeah, thanks for asking. Uh, I'm, it's actually a bit of a left turn. I'm, I've started a side gig uh, during COVID. I had some time and, uh, you know, stuck home too much, watched everything on Netflix. So I started thinking about, um, you know, some of the learnings that I've had over the years. I think I mentioned earlier that, uh, you know, I've reinvented myself many times in my own career. And I thought that I might write a sequel to my book um, about that. You know, what does it take to be agile and adaptable? What does it take to reinvent oneself? Um, as I said a minute ago, you know, with all this exponential change, with the uh, the need to be self sufficient, I thought that there there's really something interesting around trying to figure out how to do that, and you know, what is it that I've done, and what is it that other people have done. So um, I've decided to build content around that subject to help other people. Um, I'm thinking about launching a podcast where people can share their inspiring stories of reinvention. Um, I'm thinking about a book. I'm thinking about a, a uh, an online course um, and, and maybe some a coaching program around that. Um, I'm early stage on it and doing a lot of research and trying to decide. I've written the book many times in my head and outlines and, and didn't pull the trigger because, you know, self-publishing is a whole new ball game and, you know, um, you got to spend money to, to write books, and I find books are these days are marketing devices for some other business. So, um, but I have all this content, and I want to figure out a way to share that. So, it's um, I'm pretty excited about it because I think it is there's a real need for this. Uh, in, in, uh, the people have to learn how to be 
as I said, agile and adaptable and to be able to reinvent and pivot as I have. I think that's really interesting. Uh, and the, the need for reinvention can be triggered through so many different situations. Um, you know, some you self-select and some might be imposed. Um, and, and I, for one, you know, in, 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 I, I did not um, plan necessarily to start a tech startup. Uh, and at a certain point in my career, I certainly um, was excited about the opportunity of maybe exploring new opportunities. And, and this path sort of presented itself. But I love the idea of being more intentional in that reinvention. Um, you know, your, your career could span 25, 30, 35, 40 years. It's a long time. Um, and, and to think about being in a position to take different directions and, and recognize unique opportunities, I think, is a really um, exciting avenue to pursue. So I, and I think there's a real opportunity Thanks. there. Thank you. Yeah, I, it's funny. I've interviewed uh, a bunch of people in the last month or so just to see, I guess, auditions for a podcast to, to see what, it, you know, what people's experiences are like. And I put out a call for people to share their stories. And I've spoken to, you know, a couple dozen people and they fall into kind of two main categories. They're either, you know, hit a wall or a glass ceiling and, you know, like, something bad happens, pandemics, and they have to make a change and maybe not be well equipped to do so, but it kind of forced upon them. Mm -hmm. And then there's a crew that are very intentional who, you know, are in the rat race, got the golden handcuffs, like all the cliches, but then kind of look at themselves in the mirror and say, like, is this what I want to be doing for the next 20 years? Is this me? Is this, the, is this the greatest youth of my time and energy and talents? And they go through this kind of self-assessment and evaluation and, and end up on a very different path. And um, I don't know. I think in terms of the content that I'm creating, uh, it could be applicable to either, although I tend to think that there's more self-sufficiency through entrepreneurship as opposed to just pivoting and getting another job. But that's you know each to their own you you have a bias on the entrepreneurial side so but but i i don't disagree um so listen this is one of my favorite questions if you could have one superpower uh what would it be and why well i have a superpower my superpower is <laughs> i'm just curious you know and and i'm 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 always trying to figure stuff out and it's just i'm hardwired to do that um, so I'll, I'll stick with that. I, like, I really feel like it's my unique ability to, to do this and to help be, be an advisor to, to people through channeling that curiosity. All right. Well, that, that is a segue to the next question, uh, which is all about curiosity. Now, I know you're curious about uh, you know, pursuing this path of helping people to reinvent themselves. But aside from that, what are you curious about right now? And is anything that has you thinking differently? in light of the current circumstances. And yes, that's probably specific to COVID. Um, but, you know, maybe in terms of how you engage with founders or the services you provide to founders or just, you know, in, in the world specifically around the, the tech ecosystem, what, what's, what's got you thinking now? Well, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm worried about, um, I'm just worried about the recovery. Like I, I, I'm not that I'm curious about what's going to happen and what, cause I think we're in a bit of a period where there's a cushion because of, you know, the government programs and, and so forth. And I think that when that falls away, there's going to be some real ca more casualties that have been able to hang on. And, um, and I, and I'm, and I'm worried about the United States. I just think, it's a bit rudderless right now and they're focused on the wrong things and don't really understand what's important. Um, there's too much infighting, not really trying to find a vision for the future and what, what role and, and they've abdicated so much responsibility on the global stage that like the entire global economy is, you know, reeling from that and then the pandemic. So, you know, I'm curious about how that's going to play out. Cause I think it's going to, you know, Americans, get a cold and and we get the flu and so I, i'm thinking a lot about that and i'm trying not to get depressed about it but 
it is a bit depressing. Like, I'm really shocked by what's going on south of the border, frankly. Well, you're, you're not the only one thinking about it. In our earlier uh, podcast interview with John Love, the CEO of Kingset Capital, um, he also spoke about uh, the role of the U.S. globally. And, and as they have removed themselves and pulled, them, pulled themselves out of so many different organizations, you know, the, the concern about who fills that void. Uh, I, I, agree, I agree with John. I, I, I heard that interview. It was a very interesting com- comment. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's really sc- scary because, um, you know, we need that kind of leadership. And, and, I, and on the other hand, like, I think there's great opportunities because somebody will fill the void. And so, you know, there's opportunities, for example, because of the immigration situation in the U.S., for Canada to attract great people. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we're 35 million in a landmass that's, you know, the biggest or second biggest in the world. So we got lots of room. So come on board. I mean, people that they don't like, we'll take them because yeah. I think there's some great, you know, people coming from all over the world with engineers and all sorts of skills that can really help advance our economy. I think you're right. I think we need to, uh, uh, particularly as entrepreneurs, you know, maybe, maybe we need to look at how we can, uh, you know, it's, it's not just about bringing more people to the same cities within Canada. I think it truly is about expanding, um, uh, you know, our, the outlets, the number of places that, you know, we can really build uh, that kind of infrastructure and those kinds of resources and give people, you know, purpose. Um, and I think that's the advantage that the U.S. does have in terms of, so, you know, so many places that people can go and build great businesses and build great careers and, and have families. And I think that is one of our limitations on this side of the border. Yeah. I mean, I think, listen, if you look at entrepreneurs, they're always immigrants, you know, they, they, they don't fit into the normal, you know, institutional lifestyle. So immigrants have to figure it out and they solve problems. And I mean, most of the great, Success stories are all immigrant success stories. Um, so you want great immigrants. Uh, I, I just, I don't get it. But anyhow. I agree. Uh, is there anything you wish you had known when you first started out? You know, we always learn a lot along the way, but anything that would have been helpful to have known then? It's a lot of stuff. I mean, I wrote a book. There's 50 story, you know, 50 lessons uh, in my book of, of mistakes that entrepreneurs made. Um, I don't know. I, I guess I, 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 I was a bit of more of a risk taker as a younger man. And I guess I, if, if I could have done it differently, I would have maybe taken less risk mm-hmm. um, or, you know, maybe taking more chips off the table. Um, as a young man, you tend to roll the dice a lot, and uh, and I did. Um, so maybe that was a lesson learned. You know, save more for a rainy day because they do come for sure. Look what's going on now. Yeah, we've seen um, that. So that that's a that's a good lesson. Is you know, a lot of entrepreneurs don't pay themselves first. You know, they're growing the business and they're you know, begging, borrowing, stealing to try and make payroll and get going and feed the burn rate. And, you know, they, they tend to pay themselves last. And so it's ironic because, you know, it's supposed to be the other way around, like more risk means more return, but you know, maybe there'll be return down the road, but you're taking a lot of risk. And so, you know, you should take care of yourself a little bit. And that was the lesson I learned later. Yeah, uh, that one I wish I, I I certainly took a lot of counsel in my early days as I began to start up uh, start my startup, but I didn't quite realize how 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 you know you prioritized yourself last. Um, so that's been a been a learning process. Now I'm not yeah. sure it would have changed anything, uh, but that is life as a founder and uh, the ecosystem in general continues to support that line of thinking. Um, yeah, you just got to be smart about it. And yeah, remember why you're doing it, right? Like people are in business to, to provide for the uh, economic well-being of their family, right? Like that's the point. You're not building, yes, we're solving problems. Yes, we're, you know, our egos get involved. But at the end of the day, you got to provide for your family. I mean, that's the bottom line is the bottom line, right? Right. Uh, well, I agree. Uh, I want to thank you, Jeff, for taking the time for being with us today. 
Um, I continue to value our, our friendship as well as your professional um, role that you pro that you provide uh, through Faskin for our firm. Um, and we're, we're glad to have you by our side. And I look forward to continuing to collaborate uh, and investing in this amazing tech ecosystem and seeing what comes from it all. So oh, thanks. It's been great. My pleasure. I really enjoyed this. Thanks for having me on. We'll Terrific. see you soon. You bet. Have a great day. Bye now. Bye-bye. I want to thank Jeff Dennis for joining us on today's podcast and for sharing his journey from early beginnings as an entrepreneur to now leading the team at Faskin with over 40 lawyers across Canada dedicated to the startup space. Great learning for all of our listeners and an opportunity to gain insight into what it takes to be an effective leader. Please be sure to tune in again for future discussions with leading professionals and industry experts who all have something to say about experience in the built world and the impact that technology is having on the largest asset class in the world, commercial real estate. If you or someone you know would like to be a guest on a future episode, please reach out to me directly at david at hiloapp.com. And until our next episode, I wish you all continued success in building community where you work or live. Thank you.